Well, it's about freaking time. The hook of Trepang 2 is that it's a tribute to the 2006 monolith classic, Fear, an FPS that was one part stylish action in the vein of the Matrix, another part Japanese horror, an unusual combination that made it one of the finest action horror titles of the 2000s, and it still holds up today. <laughs> Trepang 2 first came onto my radar back in 2019, and not long after I got my hands on its demo. Like many, I was impressed with how faithful it felt to the game that inspired it, and was eager to get the full experience. Then came the wait, a long four-year wait, during which time many, including myself, were shouting on the comments, message boards, and discords, where is Trepang 2? When is this game coming out? But now, in 2023, with the Wormmeisters at Team 17 Publishing, Trepang 2 has finally been released. Praise Alma! <laughs> In today's video, I'll be lending my thoughts on this spooky throwback, and whether or not it's worth all the property damage. But before all that, a big thank you to the developer for providing the review code. Alrighty, let the slow-mo extravaganza begin. Indeed, Trepang 2 is a tribute to fear, and much of that game's DNA can be seen and felt throughout it, and I'll be sure to point out examples throughout this review. However, while fear is the inspiration, it's not the gospel. Trepang 2 differentiates itself from fear in several key ways, and ultimately is very much its own thing. Those coming into this expecting fear 4 might be a little disappointed, but those feelings might subside when they see what Trepang 2 brings to the table. <laughs> The opening hours of Trepang 2 vibe hard like fear. The game begins with a cinematic that stylistically matches fear's opening, and it's certainly a nostalgia trip. From there, you take control of Subject 106 as he breaks out of a high-security prison, a scene that doesn't look all too different from the Armacam facilities from fear. After turning an elite containment squad into puddles, 106 is rescued by the secret military organization, Task Force 27, who gear him up and sweep him off to his first proper mission, assaulting the Pandora Institute. There, the fear vibes linger as 106 takes on squads of soldiers within these blue offices. But then, Trepang 2 aggressively defines its own personality when it takes a hard and admittedly jarring turn into the paranormal. Now, some of you watching might be going, Kirk, so did fear. Don't you remember the ghost girl chasing you? Oh yeah, I do. But you see, in fear, it was a ghost. In Trepang, it's a radioactive hive of toxic zombies and the freaking Mothman. Mothman. See, the premise of Trepang 2 is that Task Force 27 is at war with the Horizon Corporation, who have set up black sites all over the world containing dangerous supernatural phenomenon that they are studying and exploiting for their own gain. Task Force 27 is trying to cripple Horizon by shutting down these black sites, and Subject 106 is their ace in the hole. Or should I say Point Man. It's a premise that clearly draws from the SCP Foundation, an online collaborative writing project consisting of scary stories revolving around a secret organization harboring and studying dangerous paranormal entities. Most of Trepang 2's missions, and a good amount of the side missions, revolve around a unique paranormal entity or urban legend. Some are based on more recent internet horrors, others from classic American sci-fi and folklore, and half the fun of the game is seeing what sort of madness each mission brings. Each mission is fleshed out by its own lore that can be studied through gathering intel files, and I did get a kick reading through these and piecing together exactly what was going on. And there's some solid environmental storytelling to further support. The game is good about giving players that tense, spooky feeling, and there are some good scares to be found. Although, sadly, none of them come close to the scares of fear. I still can't look at ladders without getting nervous because of that game. Now, while I enjoyed the premise and world building and felt the story presentation was solid, the actual story is pretty half-baked. It's a bare-bones plot. 
you're the hero that needs to take down the big bad guy, and it doesn't really go further than that, with villains and support characters that aren't fleshed out in any meaningful way. There just wasn't anything here to get me emotionally invested. And the game features a major plot twist that most players will see coming from miles away. Really, what you're paying to feels like is a series of self-contained, well-fleshed-out missions that are loosely connected by a thin plot, and it doesn't make for a satisfying narrative. But it does make for a lot of spectacle and fun shooting. Built in the Unreal Engine 4, Trepang 2 draws from the visuals of fear, and I would say attempts to emulate the rendering qualities of the LithTech engine that powered it. Yes, its graphics are dated by today's standards, but that doesn't take too much away from its shiny, brutal spectacle. I found many of Trepang's levels to be well composed and convincing, with some clear standouts. Textures are high quality and beautiful, and there's a satisfying attention to detail. If you're like me and find the first few levels to be on the generic side, then you'll be pleased by the variety of environments to follow, like a luxurious castle full of cultists, cold bunkers full of mystical and technological terrors, some impossible places that don't seem to exist in time or space, along with, well, more office buildings, but each with their own distinct look. Something to keep in mind is that Trepang 2 was made by a small team of four people. Yes, you heard that right, four. And when you see all of the visual elements put into this game and the quality at which they were rendered, it's nothing short of impressive. Yeah, there are some rough edges. A few spots look a little plasticky in the rendering, and level exteriors and backdrops do look pretty rough, the simplistic background shown while flying into the Pandora Institute being the prime example. And there is the occasional bit of graphical funkiness, like this ghosting effect on my gloves. Noticing these things did take me out of the experience, but I can't say they necessarily harmed it. And the game performed beautifully, with a locked smooth frame rate from start to finish. <laughs> Where I think the visuals are the strongest is in effects and lighting. Lighting and reflections are striking and very believable, bringing a lot of suspense and moodiness to the atmosphere. There's also great touches too, like the reflections within your gas mask. Particle effects are straight up god tier. Sparks from gunfire and the floating embers from fire were awe-inspiring. I haven't even mentioned that Fear's distinct icicle-like bullet trails and big chunky bullet holes have been recreated and look just as sick as I remember them. Last thing to touch on here, the environments do have a fair amount of destructibility in the form of blowing chunks out of the walls and the occasional statue, which is always fun to look at. <laughs> But there is one portion of a level where you fight within an unfinished house, and I was pleasantly surprised to see my incendiary shotgun not only blowing the boards of it into tiny chunks, but also setting them on fire. It was very cool to see, and the next time I played, I was sure to equip the grenade launcher for further scientific study. Sound design gets high marks all around. Sound effects for weapons are fantastic, as well as effects for organic and inorganic destruction. The music, however, I'm on the fence about. In general, the music is well put together and features bassy, atmospheric electronic tracks that I think complement the espionage and trippy paranormal aspects nicely. The music for the opening cinematic I particularly enjoyed, and the pause menu tune is a total jam. But for many of the combat portions, the game goes for these in-your-face, balls-to-the-wall heavy metal tracks that to me felt along the lines of Mick Gordon's music for the recent Doom games. It's certainly a sound common for FPS action, and I know for certain I'd have a great time moshing to this stuff. Great cardio moshing. But I do feel like the music is a little mismatched to the game, and the intensity of it can be distracting. I suppose when I hear this type of music, the images conjured up in my head is of satanic hellfire and dark fantasy, not necessarily spooky espionage action. I'm not saying Trepang 2 shouldn't have gotten heavy and intense, I just don't think it needed to go this hard. Trepang 2's base shooting mechanics don't stray too far from fears. Combat is straight up kinetic fury, a beautiful mess of explosions and blood splatter. Battles are intense and frantic and keep players scrappy, encouraging them to bulldoze enemies head on and terrify them with speedy hit and run tactics. Guns feel amazing across the board, all have a powerful chunky fire paid off with ragdolling enemies flying about, sometimes in pieces. Pistols tear through baddies with precision, machine guns chew them up, and the shotguns, 
Well, they speak for themselves. And actions like sliding and melee are responsive and precise, never interrupting the flow of combat, but rather adding to it. When it comes to the raw mechanical feel, you can't get much better than this. And you'll be encouraged to try more risky over-the-top stunts because of how good and smooth everything feels. That being said, there are times where it can get overwhelming, like being blinded by the explosion of particle effects during combat and the occasional unpredictable enemy ragdoll to confuse things. But those things are like a soggy fry in a McDonald's meal. Hardly ruins the food, and it's still pretty tasty. A most magical thing is that all weapons, with a few exceptions, can be dual-wielded. And both weapon slots can hold dual-wielded weapons, leading to a lot of pain and chaos for your enemies. Dual incendiary shotguns? Oh, this game spoils me. Unfortunately, you can't mix and match the dual wields, so no fun combos like a pistol with a shotgun or a sniper rifle with a machine gun. It would have been fun to play around with something like that, although I can't say the game is worse for not having it. Ha, <laughs> ah, that's never getting old. A nice feature too is that weapons can be customized with weapon parts collected throughout the game, boosting their effectiveness but with a trade-off to keep the balance. So incendiary rounds for the shotgun will set enemies on fire, but the weapon will have less damage and accuracy all around. And laser sights for many of the guns will make them more accurate, but make it easier for enemies to detect you. Like in Fear, the player can enter a focused state where time slows down, allowing them to weave between bullets and eviscerate enemies before they know what's hitting them. It's an absolute spectacle. Sparks fill the air, plaster and stone zoom by, shockwaves expand like liquid, and enemies cry out in terror. It matches Fear's slow-mo sights and, dare I say, makes them messier. Plus, sometimes you can catch some fun details while in it. Like here, you can see a grenade I fired knocked this guy back before exploding. And look at this whole-ass brain that popped out of this guy's head. Haha, <laughs> dear lord. Naturally, focus can only be used in limited bursts, and is only charged by eliminating enemies, which keeps it from being too much of a crutch. You can't live in slow-mo in this game. You have to earn it. What's pleasantly surprising about Trepang 2 is that it features a host of stealth mechanics to complement the shooting. You can hide in the shadows to sneak past enemies and then grab them from behind to give them a chiropractic adjustment. Or slap a grenade on them and send them right back to their buddies. <laughs> Most weapons can be outfitted with suppressors too if you prefer to go for silent headshots. And where shooting has focus as its special ability, stealth has the cloak. When activated, you are completely invisible, opening the door for all sorts of possibilities. But it only lasts a short time, and attacking deactivates it. So you have to use it wisely and in short bursts. Unlike focus though, the cloak recharges automatically, so you always have it as an option. Good, good. Now, the stealth mechanics aren't nearly on the same level as, say, a Splinter Cell or Metal Gear, but they are strong enough to stand on their own two feet. There were many sections throughout the game I was able to tackle pure stealth, which, as a stealth gaming fan, I really appreciated. I don't think you can get through a whole mission pure stealth, take that one with a grain of salt because I haven't tried it with all of them, but the fact that players have some agency in how they tackle combat situations I think is really cool. You could say it's not all that different from what Crisis did, although Trepang 2 has a lot more pizzazz. <laughs> What I enjoyed most was using the shooting mechanics with the stealth ones. The cloak is a great way to flank enemies and can save you in critical moments. And a quick jab to an enemy's face can stagger them and let you snag them mid-battle and use as a human shield. The game straight up made me feel like the Predator, and that's a good feeling to have. <laughs> Truly, I have very little to complain about when it comes to gameplay, but there were a handful of things I found to pick on. I'm a little bummed this game doesn't offer any challenges to go through levels in certain playstyles, like perhaps going through without alerting too many enemies, or using certain weapon loadouts, or not using special abilities like Focus or Cloak. I feel like that would have added some nice replayability, although to be fair, the Steam achievements do have some fun challenges along these lines. <laughs> In Trepang 2, you can enjoy good old-fashioned grenades, firebombs, and throwing axes, but for whatever reason, you can only hold one of them at a time, which is a little silly. Why can't I hold two at a time and swap between them with a key press? What balance am I throwing off by having that? 
And last, the boss battles are alright. They definitely carry the kinetic brutality of regular combat. However, since most of them can melt you in a head-on fight, you'll have to rely on hit-and-run tactics, which has its excitement, but as these battles can be fairly lengthy, it can get pretty tiresome. In between missions, the player will return to the safe house. Here they can choose their next mission, equip new weapons, customize them, and test them out if they want. There's a combat simulator that we'll touch on a little later, and players can also customize 106. And I got a kick out of this because you can only customize what you are able to see, being your gloves, sleeves, pants, and shoes. And I don't know if I've ever seen it done this way, that or I just don't remember. For my 106, I chose white gloves, yellow shoes, and the rest all black. I went for a Special Forces Mickey Mouse. <laughs> now, while the safe house is cool, I feel like it was unnecessary. I mean, it's a hair too big and pretty empty. The only NPC you can interact with is the quartermaster, who just gives you a quick piece of advice before every mission. Those cultists are a bunch of freaks. You'll see what I'm talking about. 90% of my interactions with this place was running in, choosing my next mission, swapping out weapons, and then running right back out. I feel like everything featured here could have been handled in menus. Although, to be fair, it does serve a narrative purpose a handful of times, but I don't know if those moments totally justify it. Trepang 2 is not a terribly long game, but I also wouldn't say it's short. The main campaign features only five missions. Eh, technically six. And yeah, the end did come sooner than I would have liked. But these missions are lengthy, long enough to where I feel like they could have been broken up into two, and most of them take some wild turns at the midpoint that morphs them into something completely different. Once again, using the Pandora Institute as an example, the first half is not all that different from a Call of Duty level, a series of intense firefights in an urban setting. But then the second half is something out of Resident Evil or perhaps Aliens, fending off charging zombies in their nasty stink hive and using them to destroy big red goo tanks. Yeah, these mid-mission switch-ups can be pretty bizarre and jarring, but the surprise of them is what kept me invested. I was always curious about what was around the next corner. Oh yeah, I definitely would have liked to have more missions in the main campaign, but I felt like each gave me as much as they could, and I genuinely felt fulfilled after each one. In between the main campaign, though, players can enjoy side missions. Now, these are vastly shorter than the main missions and largely revolve around wave-based combat, right? Complete a series of objectives and keep back the bad guys as you do it. But as I mentioned earlier, a good amount of the side missions revolve around their own unique paranormal phenomenon, which are quite fun to behold, and keep them from feeling like padding. <laughs> Where the padding can be found, and in this regard I mean padding in the best possible way, are the combat simulator missions found in the safe house. The combat simulator is your classic arcade horde mode, where you take on ever-escalating waves of enemies over the course of 20 rounds, earning cash that can be used to buy better weapons and equipment. It features a ton of maps, most of which are based off of arenas from the main campaign, and is a great way to put the combat through its paces. The only thing missing is the means for bragging rights. These maps don't have any sort of score system, beyond earned cash. And even if it did, there's no online leaderboards to show them off. An unfortunate oversight. So between the main, side, and simulator missions, there's a respectable amount of game here. But with that said, I am definitely hoping for some DLC. Now, a little birdie told me the dev team is taking some much needed time off, which hells yeah, glad to hear it. But I am crossing my fingers tightly they follow Trepang 2 up with more missions. I mean, the whole concept of this game, each mission revolving around its own urban legend or phenomenon, has a ton of potential. There's a lot of spooky legends out there, folks, and I would love to see a Sasquatch mission. Trepang 2 is a stupid amount of fun. Its mixture of furious firefights and cold, calculated stealth is like FPS dessert for me. A guilty pleasure I'm not all that guilty about. It's not without its flaws. While I do enjoy the premise, I wish the core narrative was a lot stronger. And there are some annoying design choices. However, I think the dev team have done a tremendous job recreating Fear's mechanics and making them their own. For action lovers and those who like their FPSs to be pure insanity, this is one to check out. And for the Fear fans, this is not going to scratch the Fear itch as much as you might hope, but it's still absolutely worth your time. Your bullet time. <laughs> what are your thoughts on Trepang 2? Be sure to let me know down in the comments. 
If you dug the video, please be sure to subscribe, like, share, and smack that bell. If you want to come say hi, my Discord is linked below, along with my affiliate links. I'm Kirk, and thank you for watching this video. Stay safe out there.